Good afternoon. And a warm welcome to all of the participants who uh, are returning to us for the second week of our virtual program on enhancing security and justice coordination to counter transnational organized crime. My name is Dr. Katherine Lena Kelly, and I am the Associate Professor of Justice and Rule of Law at the Africa Center, the faculty lead for this program, and the moderator of today's session. The second plenary session here today will be about fostering national level interagency coordination to counter transnational organized crime. On the virtual dais with me for this panel, we will have Ms. Samira Guide, Executive Director of the Hiral Institute and former Special Advisor to the Prime Minister of Somalia, Senior Captain Jamel Ben Omran, Superintendent of the Tunisian Navy, and Mr. Brice Severin Pongui a lawyer, an arbitrator, and program coordinator on illegal logging for the U.S. Forest Service in Republic of Congo. Pleased to have all of you with me on the dais today. Very quickly, a few words to summarize last week so that we have context going into our panel today. Last week, we looked at coordination as a potential way of building African states and societies resilient to transnational organized crime. And by resilience, we meant the preparedness of governments, states, and civil society to deal with transnational organized crime. By resilience, we're also referring to how people and institutions deal with crime in ways that mitigate its harms and reduce future vulnerabilities to it. In discussing resilience last week, we used the ENACT Organized Crime Index to look at different ways of breaking down trends in relation to the criminal actors who are involved and the different criminal markets that are involved as well as different aspects of response that may be worth focusing on from the state or civil society side of things. To remind you, the index looks at how um, active four different kinds of criminal actors are, state embedded actors, criminal actors, criminal networks, foreign actors, and what the index calls mafia style groups, which really mean groups with some sort of recognizable uh, label and territorial control of a particular part of territory within a country, um, so these are non-state actors um, with recognizable labels who are, who are involved in crime. Uh, the index also measures how pervasive 10 different kinds of criminal markets are ranging across different kinds of drugs, human trafficking and human smuggling, arms trafficking, flora and fauna crimes, et cetera. And we learned that criminality scores on the index, which are measuring the value and the reach of these different kinds of criminal markets, as well as the influence of different criminal actors, are highest in Eastern Africa right now, according to the index. The index also looks at different types of response mechanisms for transnational organized crime that together could form a holistic way of addressing crime. So it looks into countries' political leadership, governance processes, laws and policies, financial and security frameworks, justice frameworks and capacities, and civil society activities. And resilience, according to the index, is lowest currently in the Central African region. The resilience factor that's weakest overall across the continent currently is victim and witness support, uh, followed by prevention-related activities and government transparency and accountability. And these resilience factors in particular bring us back to last week's presentation about how the underlying incentives that people or groups might have to engage in transnational organized crime relate to development and governance factors, things like the availability of alternative livelihoods to transnational organized crime, things like how legitimate citizens think the state, its laws, and its responses to crime are, and things like how transparent and accountable high, certain high-level state officials are to citizens, and therefore how deterred um, they feel from any potential temptations to facilitate certain forms of transnational organized crime. Countries that have high criminality and low resilience scores, this is about 20, 20 different ones, um, according to the index, should be interested in developing or refining policies and strategies that address some of these resilience factors urgently. But even countries that have low criminality and low resilience, this is another um, 30 different African countries scored on the index, should be attentive to these ideas so that they stop crime before it starts and don't create incentives for engagement in it that could foster new security challenges for their countries or regions. So paying attention to these different actors incentives and how different security development and governance uh, factors around them shape their incentives is part of taking what applied researchers would often call a political economy approach to addressing transnational organized crime. 
And to get us to today's panel, um, this leads us to, to, to come back to one more point from last week. Coordination of security and justice actors is one important way that African states can work towards increasing resilience to transnational organized crime in ways that are accounting for these incentives. The actors often trying to counter transnational organized crime don't necessarily have opportunities to communicate and strategize together, especially when they're from different agencies in the security sector or from different parts of the criminal justice chain dealing with prosecuting transnational crimes, or when they specialize in different forms of transnational organized crime in the first place. So we need to think about how to strengthen existing coordination mechanisms and perhaps um, amongst ourselves in the discussion groups, think about um, new and innovative ways of, of doing coordination in order to fill some of these gaps. And that brings me to the topic of today's panel. Um, the key objectives for the webinar today, we're hoping that um, the panel will provide a greater understanding of why national level interagency coordination, both within and outside of the security sector is important for countering transnational organized crime. We hope to compare and contrast the perspectives of defense and security, um, uh, military and civilian actors, security and justice actors of different sorts about the benefits and the limits of coordination of this kind to counter transnational organized crime. And we hope to identify uh, through some of the examples the panelists may provide some key strategy, policy, and technical elements of interagency coordination that could have an influence on African states' resilience to different kinds of transnational organized crime. And with that, I'm very happy to introduce three distinguished panelists that we have um, uh, joining us today for this discussion. First, we have Ms. Samira Guide. She is here, the Haral Institute's Executive Director. Samira is a regional and security analyst with extensive experience in Somalia and the Horn of Africa. She served as the former special advisor to the Prime Minister of the Federal Republic of Somalia from May 2017 to July 2020. She led the extensive transformation and reform efforts of the Somali security sector, one of the key priorities for Somalia. Samira has extensive experience working in the public sector and international organizations and has been an instrumental figure in security and economic reforms implemented by the Prime Minister. And before that job, Samira works with the African Union Mission in Somalia as a special advisor. And um, she is a recent distinguished graduate from the National Defense University in the US with an MA in Strategic Security Studies. Next, we have with us Senior Captain Jamel Ben Omran. He is the Superintendent of the Tunisian Navy with diplomas from the Tunisian Naval Academy, the Tunisian Staff College, and the War College. He also holds a master's degree in strategic security studies from the College of International Security Affairs at the National Defense University here in Washington, DC. He has been awarded the Military Medal of Merit, has experienced teaching in various military training establishments, has commanded several patrol units and a fast missile corvette, and has had a wide variety of operational assignments. He has commanded the 10th Division of Patrol Boats, headed the Offshore Patrol Vessels Squadron, headed the Operations and Intelligence Office at the Navy headquarters, and commanded the SPOC's main naval base, as well as the Navy's Southern and Northern districts at different points in his career. As Mr. Bryce Pongi is a lawyer for the Bradsville Bar and Ombudsman at the Center of Mediation and Arbitration of Congo, as well as consultant for the International Program for the US Forest Service in the Republic of Congo since 2009, he has been a lawyer, counsel, and advocate, including environmental law, marine law, contract law, administrative law, intellectual property law. He is also an honorary president of the Green Brain Institute that works to help implement the African Union's Agenda 2063. Mr. Pongi has a master's degree in environment and territory in the field of environmental law, economics and management, international law and environmental comparative specialty from the University of Limoges in 2007. He is also a graduate of the Public University of Congo in the National School of Administration and Judiciary, INAM. So welcome to all three of you uh, to this panel. Thank you for being with us today. Let's jump right into the discussion. I think I will start by posing the first question to 
Um, Ms. Samira Guide. You have previously served as the principal national security advisor to Somalia's prime minister, looking extensively at security and justice coordination issues in that part of your job. So could you, um, let me ask you this, what kinds of national level interagency coordination efforts did you undertake to deal with transnational organized crime? And what did you find to be the principal successes and challenges of those efforts? I'll give you um, perhaps about seven minutes to tell us a little bit about that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kat. Good, good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're logging in from. Uh, thank you for inviting me, and I'm very honored to be speaking with you all today. Uh, as uh, Kat just mentioned, I served as the principal security advisor to the prime minister, but in this role, uh, I was also the coordinator of the security and justice uh, cabinet roadmap that brings together all the re relevant line ministries and security institutions under one cluster. But before I speak on the coordination efforts in regards to TOC, I just wanted to ensure I first put Somalia in context. You know, Somalia's state collapse in 1991 was followed by 10 years of complete anarchy, where countries in the region and the international community uh, attempted to work with the Somali elite and the main power brokers to reinstitute the state. Several reconciliation conferences later in 2000, a transitional national government was formed in Djibouti. Uh, a president appointed, he returned to Somalia, but the government was not able to take hold. So a second attempt was made, and this was more serious, where we formed the transitional federal government in Nairobi in 2004. And then the president had the hard task of trying to take the seat of government from the international, uh, they were called the Islamic Courts Union at the time, uh, with the support of the Ethi uh, Ethiopian military. And that led to really the Al-Shabaab insurgency that exists to date. So with that in mind and understanding the challenges in Somalia are immense, uh, in 2012, um, we came to we came out of this transitional federal governments. Uh, we came into the first, um, you know, recog internationally recognized government. So we've just had, I would say, um, around eight years, eight years of uh, you know state building, proper state building. The government that was then uh, that then came in in 2012 first focused on completing the federal map because we're now adopting a new system, which meant creating federal member states. We have five of them now. And then this government that I worked with came in in 2017 and came up now with the national security architecture that would clarify the responsibilities between the federal government and the federal member states. And all of this is happening while we also have the al Shabaab insurgency that we're, we're fighting at the same time, but not alone. We're working with the international community. We have the African Union mission in Somalia. We have approximately 19,000 forces now in Somalia working with the Somali security forces to, to fight al Shabaab. So while Al-Shabaab is the main threat to Somalia's peace and security, the country has really been involved in a very slow and, uh, and painful state building process while fighting this insurgency. So we don't have this robust rule of law systems. The state capacity is weak and fragile, and most of our resources really go to fighting the insurgency and basically just existing, which means wages and running costs to our ministries. So on one end, you have this a uh, 15 year old terrorist organization that we're bat battling that really mainly survives on criminal activities to fund its insurgency. And then on the other end of that perspective, you have a nation that is at the nascent stages of rebuilding its state institutions and has very low capacity to provide basic services, let alone combat um, organized crime. So given that context, uh, the, our main challenge is of course Al-Shabaab and the group itself raises approximately 120 million US dollars a year just through its illicit revenues. They raise this money through extortion and racketeering as well as trafficking. Uh, their main sources of revenue come through taxation of goods uh, through the main supply routes. They have about 120 illegal checkpoints uh, in, nationwide. Then they also tax businesses and sales, uh, sales taxes in the capital and in Kismayo, which is also a port city. They have they collect the most uh, taxation from these two uh, two cities. Uh, they they levy zakat, which is 2.5 percent of all wealth. They levy zakat, uh, you know, forcefully. They extort it from uh, the communities within which they they live. And then there's the taxation of contraband goods. And in this in this case, Somalia has a charcoal export. 
uh, sugar um, sugar export, not export import that comes through Somalia as a transit and goes into the region. And then you have also drugs, but I would say charcoal and sugar would be the main uh, contraband goods that are, are currently being uh, smuggled in Somalia. And then on the other hand, we also face a very serious challenge in human smuggling. And this of course is because of the 30 years of state collapse. Um, there's a migration issue. Uh, people are paying quite a lot of money to find their way out of the country, uh, travel throughout Africa or sometimes through, um, uh, through the Gulf of Aden to, to just make it out of here and, and paying quite a bit through these human smuggling routes. So what we have done as a government at the national level since I joined, which was in 2017, we really didn't have uh, coordination mechanisms with, this, with the federal member states, which had just been formed. So we agreed a national security architecture, which was a landmark agreement that basically divided the responsibilities between the federal government and the federal member states. So we established the structures like the National Security Council, the regional security council that would coordinate with them, the technical committees that would exist below that, that would enhance coordination and collaboration. Uh, we set up coordination mechanisms for the security forces in the capital city that were really at the time not really talking. You had the intelligence, the police and the military, as well as the African Union forces that are also supporting security in, in the capital. But I have to be very honest, none of this has made much impact. Uh, and this is because of three things. I think number one is the teething problems that comes with changing structures. We're moving from a central, central strong government to a federal state. So understanding the federal uh, federal structure, adopting it and, and really not having the, the rules and procedures and systems that come with it. So that's one. The second thing is we're really rebuilding everything again. You have Somalis who have lived through 30, 30 years of civil war who have never really seen state, uh, how a state functions. So you're really working with that. And then on the third part, we had uh, political challenges between the federal government and the federal member states that really made sure that we, we cannot move that agenda forward. So we really focused on the federal government and what we can do. So on the federal level, we focused on three areas. Number one was uh, improving our relationship with the UN panel of experts who worked with us uh, in following the money uh, in tracking the illicit um, imports. Uh, basically, we worked with the UN to coordinate this uh, these efforts. Uh, we had worked with their predecessor, the Somali Eritrea Monitoring Group to get a charcoal bag uh, for the ch uh, charcoal exports that were coming out of Somalia. And this was successful. And then at the federal level, we also passed the Anti-Money anti Laundering and Countering the Financing of Terrorism Act and established a financial reporting center. Uh, so this was, it's just a financial intelligence unit, unit that reviews, analyzes and reports on suspicious and illicit financial transactions. That's also been very difficult to, to work with just because of the systems that we have in play, a business community that is quite strong, government uh, structures that cannot really follow up on uh, you know, the business community because of no ID system, no national ID, uh, you know, no judicial, no strong judicial service to, to really follow up on when you, um, when you arrest uh, the police, uh, the police uh, forces are also not well capacitated. So we've worked with a number of donors to work on capacity building of our CID, of our police forces, of our judici judiciary to improve on that. And then finally, we had a special envoy for migration, which is a major issue. And the lady uh, who's in charge of this is sits at the prime minister's office and works on this uh, migration human smuggling issues and has worked quite a bit with UNODC and other uh, UN agencies in, in, in trying to improve uh, our, our systems and structures. So that's where we are. I, I would think not much of a success uh, story, but we're really at the beginning. Thank you so much, Samira, for sharing um, where you have focused your approach so far, but also for highlighting how um, in terms of making progress on those issues, um, it depends on some of the other factors um, that you mentioned, um, thinking about justice systems, thinking about um, citizens, thinking about um, some of these other ways that um, other things that you have yet to um, fully flesh out um, interlock with these things. That's very helpful. Um, and thank you for the um, introduction to some of the context in Somalia, which is an interesting case that raises quite a few questions about, um, you know, when we're dealing with fragile states or, or state building um, contexts, how are some of the things that we're talking about in this seminar um, uh, applicable um, in, in those contexts, as well as in places that have not gone through um, quite the same history um, that Somalia has with some of these issues. Great. Um, I think next I would like to turn to um, Senior Captain Omran. And let me ask you a, a question that's similar to that one about your work um, in, in the Tunisian context. Uh, and I will, I think you are going to speak to us in French. So let me pose the question to you in French as well. 
En tant que commandant maritime dans la marine, as a maritime commander in the Tunisian Navy, you have worked on a great range of security issues, uh, including different forms of organized crime, such as drug trafficking, human trafficking. What type of interagency cooperation or interministerial cooperation um, that you have worked on? What kind must be used to um, meet to, to fight against TOC? And what successes uh, have you had? So if you can take a few minutes to talk about your context in Tunisia. Uh, thank you, Kat. It is customary to end with the thank yous, but I'm going to reverse this order. I want to uh, first uh, thank ACSS uh, that made this event possible and provided this opportunity to exchange our different viewpoints, and especially for us Africans who uh, lack these opportunities to meet, to get together, and to establish a dialogue about our various problems. So thank you once again. And, and this event is really, it really goes straight to the heart of the matter. This type of meeting, this type of dialogue, exchange of ideas it is really uh, what cooperation and international uh, collaboration is about in fighting against uh, organized crime, transnational organized crime. So to answer your question, based on my experience in terms of national security and more specifically uh, in mar my experience in maritime security, uh, I can say that the sea uh, with its various spaces that are governed by different rules uh, that exist within international conventions and agreements, uh, having a committee committed forces uh, and, and there's also the, the fact that there is this freedom that uh, is a problem and an advantage, that the sea is an auspicious place for illicit actions, unfortunately. There is a, a gap, a vacuum, a legal vacuum, I, I believe, uh, that hopefully will improve. And so uh, for procedures to apply laws, it, it must be applied. So there is an awful lack of specific legislation. And even though there are procedures that are in place, they're difficult to apply, especially in the maritime arena, which is a pretty specific uh, domain. So when we talk about figures and statistics, I'm not going to say anything new when I say that more than three fourths of uh, commercial traffic takes place uh, at sea. And in terms of international trade, we have to add the volume of uh, illicit, illegal, prohibited, uh, illegal trade. So uh, these are the security issues that face coastal states. And that also face the entire world, really, be it directly or indirectly. So this is a very complex environment. Um, so there are laws about the country flags uh, of ships, the rights of the owner of the cargo of a ship, uh, the right of the, the company that rules the, that governs the ship, the rights of the citizens who work aboard the ships, so this entire multinational environment aboard ships means that the, the maritime space is really an international space by excellence. But so in the face of this situation, I don't think there is a single country in the world, even the great powers that can really face this scourge alone. So, collaboration, cooperation between the various state and interstate entities. And then uh, this 
so, you know, and, and we're going through, we're living through a period of spectacular technological advantage um, progress, which really is a benefit to the good guys and the bad guys. So the bad guys use technology just as well as us. So we, and, and, and they try and find ways to evade laws and procedures. So the securing of maritime spaces is, is, is not just a national concern and this scourge can only be managed um, by all of us, by international cooperation, by the sharing of efforts and having coordination between the states in order to deal with these issues or to mitigate the effects of, of these problems. Now to get more specific, uh, the area where I come from, the region where I come from, to, which is very dear to me, so the Mediterranean Sea, it, it is a small sea, but it is it looms very large because of its economic importance uh, worldwide. And so there is uh, a, fair, a lot of criminality that is taking place and the most, the biggest problem for Tunisia at least is drug trafficking. So there's this drug trafficking uh, where the, the drugs are grown and between Europe, there's of course human trafficking as well. And in such a number of pay, countries refer to this as clandestine immigration. So Tunisia is the drug trafficking is not really a national scourge for Tunisia. So in terms of uh, seizures of drugs in the country, it does not exclude uh, what takes place on the seas. From time to time, we have seizures of large quantities of drugs along the coast of Tunisia. And this gives us an idea of uh, the people who are implicated in these activities and either, uh, either they have thrown their uh, cargo overboard or perhaps uh, the patrols taking place by different state actors on the seas um, have um, seized the cargo. So the, traf the drug trafficking exists on the sea, on the Mediterranean Sea, and these uh, 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 along the coast and the waters of Tunisia. And this is a great challenge for the Tunisian Navy, Navy and the various state actors who face this problem. So at the beginning, I was talking about the importance of coordination and cooperation between states, but the fight against uh, TOC is not only uh, at a national uh, level, but it's also important to fight this within the country and to coordinate amongst the different agencies of, of the country on a national level to begin with before we go toward the international chapter of this. So the countries that are dealing with these problems on a national level uh, must resolve this coordination issue. In uh, Tunisia, we have a conflict of uh, co competence within the different actors uh, for law enforcement. And so we have to adhere to international law but also we must honor and adhere to um, the sovereignty of the countries, the laws of the country. And at times this uh, creates some conflict uh, 
And uh, there's a prerogative given to different agencies who don't have the means to uh, fight these issues. Some, for example, some uh, state actors have the right to to address the infractions themselves and the uh, guilty parties themselves to uh, ensure that they are honoring their own responsibilities and fulfilling their own responsibilities. There are other state actors who have the capacity and the resources, but they don't necessarily have the rights to um, to put into action to support the uh, Tunisian law to apply them in different circumstances. And so this is an issue in my from my perspective. In Tunisia, to counter this problem, this phenomena, we have taken uh, certain initiatives uh, to try to include as many ministries as possible on issues arriving on the seas and to see how we can improve um, the coordination between the different agencies of the state. To um, implement a national strategy at, and so that we can better work with the international community and to take advantage of the experience of and resources of others and to to prepare um, also to 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 better coordinate with the international community we had to uh, assemble all of the actors all of the expertise the, the, to have a central um, effort and these efforts have given a uh, way to a better coordination at a national level, which is the Secretariat of the Seas, the Ministry of the Seas, and it, uh, it's, it's part of the executive government. And it, it assembles everybody under the umbrella. Uh, everybody's included under this uh, ministry. Uh, it includes, it's a civilian, it includes civilians, it's uh, led by a woman, and I wish her all the best in the world, in her, and this, and this work is directly from the uh, head of state under the executive branch. And so the strengthening of these efforts uh, must be done through the legislation as well, the parliament, uh, we need uh, human resources and the uh, Tunisian army also continues to work with the different agencies to fulfill its responsibilities. And the uh, Navy is taking on the position of leader to assemble all of the national leaders and to speak uh, with one voice, uh, one Tunisian voice to the international community. Thank you, that is excellent. I'm going to ask you perhaps one more minute to resume all this and then we will I, then I will have another question for you later. So yes, thank you to cite uh, to, to the to mention the challenges that we are encountering they are essentially uh to 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 work together with the international community to bring all of the state actors together to work together the marriage of the different sources of information on an international level to connect tunisia with different sources of intelligence and inter international intelligence to have the means to do so to uh, and to have long term range goals in time and in space to work together to fight against uh, transnational organized crime. In terms of successes, I can say the two things, two, two highlights that can uh, we can mention as success stories, that Tunisia established a clear structure for the coordination 
as well as a strategy that was put into place to 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 counter this scourge and and we have different uh, arenas of, of of efforts we have identified the uh the uh targeted organizations uh and we have also targeted different agencies who have different expertise to fight the scourge thank you so much commander yes you have uh highlighted very good examples from tunisia for the secretariat of the seas as you mentioned you have also well explained the creation of these kinds of organizations and this coordination must must uh, also be part of a development of a strategy to fight TOC. So we will come back to these themes uh, throughout the session, I am quite sure. I'm, I'm going to continue Matt, now with Maître Master Brice Pongui. May I ask you to take maybe seven minutes to respond to the following question. As we know, you are currently leading a international work group in the Republic of Congo that is working with a whole panoply of actors and of state actors and civil society in the fight against illegal, uh, illegal um, logging. And so all the a number of different ministries are represented and they work together to respond to this illegal logging. Please, uh, we want to know, learn more about it in a few minutes, the details of, of your work and what you believe are the, the biggest challenges as well as your successes in this fight. Thank you so much, Kat, for this opportunity that you are giving me once again to speak, to address, to, to speak of our of our experience in terms of the management uh, of, of working with different actors. In the case of our project, uh, it is supported by the Forestry Service of the United States and uh, International Fight Against uh, Illegal Logging. This project was entitled, was, was, was to strengthen the system to detect and to over, and for oversight of the forestry in Congo and to find mechanisms uh, to also work with our neighbors, Cameroon and Gabon. As you mentioned, it's, uh, it's a multi-actor uh, endeavor multi-state endeavor. We have the agents that represent the forestry ministry, the uh, financial minister, the ministry, the, um, the, the national finance uh, investigative arm. We have Interpol working with us. We also have uh, civil service organizations working with us. Officially, we have 18 members, of which four uh, are in place permanently and others uh, who are uh, resource persons. In this uh, task force, there are women, there are young people, more seasoned people, and this uh, task force is uh, aims to to achieve the objectives that we have and it is a framework that offers all of the participants to to get uh, better trained to receive training so the training is one component we also have the uh, people from the tax department who are uh, uh, informed on forestry issues and vice versa. We also have justice um, in, who also um, are, are part of this and part of this training to uh, on this uh, forestry commission. So it is uh, this work group, this task force is a, is an opportunity to share uh, skills, to share knowledge, to share ideas, 
to share um, intelligence, to share knowledge, and it allows us to do so uh, because we are, of course, unfortunately living still under a culture of secrecy. Uh, and so this group tries to counter that by, by strengthening the, the um, idea of working together and sharing information. This work group also gives us the opportunity to mutualize um, their efforts to, to put into practice what they know. So it's a very unique experience that has never been undertaken before. Um, we did this uh, against poaching once before, but it did not last so long. Uh, perhaps there was a lack of uh, good faith or finances, but this group was created uh, at a ministerial level in 2020. And so there is a certain basis found foundation for this group that is more solid and it gives it legitimacy to be able to act uh, in terms of, uh, uh, for example, having forestry audits to better have over have better oversight in the forest regarding illegal logging and um, and all and also uh, there's also investigative efforts to to know why certain things are taking place. So here's what I can say in terms of the composition of this task force and, and, the, ta and the work that it accomplishes. Excellent. Thank you, Maître Brice, uh, to have for having introduced this multi-actor uh, task force, and that includes the security sector, the justice sector, as well as forestry agents, um, representatives of, of trade, uh, OSA, Interpol is also involved. So I think that this method of, of accomplishing forestry audits together uh, in the hope that this will increase the sharing of efforts among these agencies and that it can also operate as a place to have a dialogue, a, a greater dialogue. So we will see how this project evolves and what uh, you will share with us during the second round of questions and, and let us know what we can learn from this example. So now I'm going to go around the table once, one more time uh, with each panelist. So I will now go into English for the first question for Ms. Guide. Okay, so um, Ms. Guide, uh, I would like to ask you a second question now. Um, sometimes national level interagency coordination can be horizontal. So we're looking at how leaders of different ministries coordinate with one another. And sometimes it can be vertical. Um, there are elements of how senior and junior officials within any ministry hierarchy or across it might work together uh, to get something done in the domain of organized crime. So given those um, two concepts, what specific aspects of horizontal and vertical coordination have you been involved with in your career? And do you have any advice to colleagues who may be trying to use these different methods to deal with complex problems or, or challenges related to transnational organized crime? And again, I'll ask you to take um, about seven minutes. Okay, I, I don't even think I'll take that long. Um, the, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we, we have the National Security Council and the Regional Security Councils that we worked in, but specifically at the Office of the Prime Minister, we worked within coordination across ministerial uh, functions and also with the security institutions. So in that role specifically, we, we, we had the coordination between the Ministry of Defense, the Ministry of Internal Security, Ministry of Justice, and then the security for security institutions that come below that uh, under all those security institutions. And I would say that um, 
that coordination system re uh, process that comes through the office of the prime minister worked better than if the ministries were coordinating on their own, just because you had the higher up the office of the prime minister coordinating that. But then the challenge is because our resources are so limited, uh, we uh, most of our, our projects or our functions are donor funded. And because the fund donors are coming to where they believe you know, there would be movement that would come straight to the office of the prime minister where you need implementation that was being done at the ministerial level, but they wouldn't be confident uh, in the systems and the structures that are in place at that level. So I think it was double edged. While it's it's helpful that you have this uh, system uh, that you have leadership at the top from the office of the prime minister. In, a, in the case where there's limited resources, the resources are only going to the top and yet the functions are being handled at the bottom. And so then you had that challenge all the time and the competition between the ministries um, um, one big challenge we had is like the office of migration that sits sat in the office of the prime minister just because the lady that was working on that needed that proximity to get things moving um it caused a conflict between that office and the office of, uh, and the ministry of internal security that is really uh, mandated to to be conducting these tasks so just because our context is different these these are challenges that come with whether going with a bottom bottom down approach or a bottom up approach so that was one thing uh the second thing is now with the you know uh, uh, within within the, the security institutions we had the ministry of internal security come up with a coordination mechanism with the ministers of internal security in all the federal member states and the police commissioners in each of the federal member states and the federal government would sit together and also sit through this coordination mechanism we had a lot of partners uh the us inl office uh unodc working on capacity city building, uh, the CID, the investigation units and all the, the police uh, departments so that we could begin to start to investigate. Uh, I don't think we expanded out during my time to the judiciary, but it was just at the police at the time. That's very interesting. So you started looking at institutions within the security sector with the idea of eventually expanding out to linking up security with justice. Very, very, very interesting um, to know that that's um, part of the strategy. Um, and you make um, very interesting points that I think will come up again about um, resources and how resources flow through hierarchies and how that can affect coordination, horizontal or vertical as well. Um, so thank you for describing that um, scenario and, and some of what you were involved in while you were in, in the government, in the office of the prime minister. Excellent. Um, thank you, Captain Almoran. I had a similar question for you. What is your experience in these two realms? First, horizontal coordination and vertical coordination. Uh, within the framework of this fight against transnational organized crime in Tunisia. And do you have advice for your colleagues in terms of these coordination methods for this fight against TOC? based on your experience. I will ask you to take about seven minutes uh, to speak about this topic. And the approaches are the same, I would say, but the way we act is a little, it, this, the, the way we act is different from one country to another. And as uh, Mrs. Guide said, uh, we are on the same path in Tunisia there is a national security council that at the political and strategic level orders passes the orders and and supports the hierarchy what you're calling horizontal coordination and it, it relies essentially on uh, the establishment of a climate of trust among the different partners so that so that we can uh, arrive at fluid circulation of intelligence and the use of common networks that work on a uh, continual basis so all actors must speak the same language and help each other. And as 
and as was said, it, it means that there, there must be symbiosis from the symbiosis from the top to the bottom between the different ministers. And this is accomplished by the National Security Council, which harmonizes, coordinates the actions of the state through the representation of the various ministries within this National Security Council. So the success of the this coordination work um, relies on information sharing the immediate sharing of information and, and on an ongoing basis the continuity of the cooperation of various state actors uh, over the long term so essentially optimizing means, uh, especially for countries with limited resources, they really need to think carefully about uh, resources that coexist within a, a single space to, to, to do one, one task. So we really have to establish coordination between the various actors in order to establish an action plan that can essentially cover all maritime spaces that are under Tunisian sovereignty or jurisdiction. And so to do this, it is imperative to have a dialogue that goes from top to bottom and, and the, that everyone be coordinated, uh, all, all, anyone who has work to do in this realm. And now in terms of vertical coordination, it, it is the key to success, in my opinion, for all ministerial institutions. We must encourage sort of this flattened leadership, horizontal leadership, uh, which promotes efficiency and speed uh, rather than, than going through this whole hierarchical system, uh, be it military hierarchy. In ministries, there is always a hierarchy that in some ways um, slows down the execution of missions and actually the, the ability to react don't, to, to react to uh, groups uh, in, in that criminal groups. Now, of course, there's the use of technology and information sources and communication um, sources. And this is this flattened leadership. And this comes under what you talked about um, for this vertical coordination. We must uh, break down obstacles. We must have more flexibility. We must have more direct contact, especially for operational situations so that we can achieve greater uh, reactivity and greater efficiency. Now, in terms of advice, uh, if I may, if I may provide some advice, uh, some advice to, to our audience, I would say seize opportunities uh, to boost a vertical and horizontal coordination or be it regional worldwide because coordination is to our advantage uh, and this uh, works uh, for the state we have to seize these opportunities where an opportunity presents itself uh, to bring all the actors together uh, so that they can within one space um, meet and uh, learn to know each other so that they can break down procedural obstacles and hierarchical obstacles. A second piece of advice, if I may, it's the division of um, essentially these uh, feedback, you know, these after action reports between the states and, and between the interministerial actors who share the same values and who and they need to act together in this fight against TOC because uh, 
the, the momentum is not on our side. Uh, the uh, actions taken within TOC is beyond imagination in many ways. And the third and last tip advice is the adaptation of legal tools for public agents without affecting human rights values. We, we must arm um, state agents with efficient and up-to-date tools so that they can be protected. But at the same time, we must always take into account human rights. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, this advice. And thank you for having talked about the National Security Council and uh, that coordinates state actions uh, with ministers. And thank you for what you said about this flattened leadership and um, how it applies to vertical coordination. Very interesting ideas that we can uh, talk about during our session of questions and answers. I will now uh, turn to Maître Pongi for a last question for you as well. It's a bit different for you because you're not part of the government. You're speaking from um, experience within the, the realm of, of a project, and you also do a lot of work with civil society. So in terms of your work in the to counter illegal logging uh, in the Central Africa region, what elements of horizontal and vertical cooperation have had the greatest influence on the results of, of, of your work? And we can say that in terms of vertical coordination, uh, you could also talk about the role of civil society. And do you think there are lessons to be learned in terms of the types of interagency cooperation with non-state actors that, that can actually reduce this illegal logging? So if you could take about seven minutes to talk about this. Yes, you are absolutely correct to uh, remind us it is a project that we are working with the government but we're working with different agencies in terms of vertical collaboration. We have, uh, we are bringing a strong, we, we are receiving a strong contribution from civil society in different ways, in particular uh, with technological tools, we have an international member that is part of the uh, task force that is bringing their um, expertise in terms of surveillance of the forest with satellite uh, uh, tools to be able to um, survey the forest. That is an important aspect because that international organizations can bring to the state in terms of coordination. That is an example. In addition, within this uh, uh, task force, we have representatives of NGOs who have a, a, a lot of experience in uh, observation of forests. They, they have uh techniques to, of, of and technologies for for auditing uh the uh forest uh logging and so forth they can they can uh, detect fraud uh, either within the forest or at the borders they um have been doing this work for a number of years and Therefore, we have people who are very well trained, who are part of our uh, task force, our work group. And so we can say that at that level, um, we also, in terms of vertical coordination, we, it's quite well activated. But as I was saying earlier, we are always facing this 
issue of the culture of secrecy one uh, a, a, a task force uh, with multiple actors some of them perhaps do not have the same approaches the same modus operandi so we have some uh, we have civil society that is very dynamic that uh, in terms, whenever there is a case uh, of fraud, they are uh, ready they, to, to sanction the guilty. But we also have to have a training in, in, to get everybody on board. It is an approach. It's a new approach that we want to encourage um, and push forward to, to have this open culture of sharing. In terms of horizontal cooperation and coordination, we have some problem there because the collaboration is done amongst the representatives of different agencies that are part of this task force. We are not yet at the level of a true horizontal coordination between the officials of each agency or ministry. They do not yet come together and sit to to at the to to coordinate issues of uh, illegal uh, forestry operations. So it would be good if this workforce, this work group, if it were attached to a uh, uh, more of a government uh, entity. So it right now it is only the uh, Ministry of the Forest, the Forestry Ministry that is that is uh, really uh, overseeing uh, these issues. But if this work group were attached also to uh, legal entities, there would be it could also it could collect information but also have a more direct access to the judiciary so that actions could take place on the ground in reality and if if and if if uh, decisions or outcomes do not come swiftly uh it it uh, the flow of information is going upstream, but truly what we can learn from this is we can see how can we make connections between this task force, this work group to, um, to the ministries, to the agencies and, and have coordination at that level. So this is what I have to say in terms of vertical as well as horizontal coordination. Thank you so much, uh, Matt, for having described uh, where you hope your uh, task force will go in the future in terms of its organization and coordination of efforts. Thank you so much.